welcome in to the Cam and Strick podcast. What up? Episode number 37. What up? What's up, Cam? What up? What, what up? What up? What are you what doing, up, man? What, what are you doing? What are you well, doing? Well, I am <clears throat> I'm looking at my private messages and I'm wondering I'm reading them all and I'm like, "Motherfuck, if these things got out, um, I think I'd be ruined." But I think anybody would be ruined if you have your private messages leaked out to the public. Um, but they're not as bad as oh boy from the Washington Capitals right now. Do we dive right into this? I mean, well, shit, I, we have you to. You just the, did. I fucking well, it's a big, it's the biggest thing going on right now, and it's and it revolves hockey. Yeah, he fucked up. Okay, all yeah. right. Let's be honest here. Talking shit about your your teammates and then your your teammates' wives, like, mm. and people ask me, "Hey, Andy, I'm gonna get Who into it." Who does right that? Man? I'm, let me get into this real quick. And people hey. fucking call me and they're texting me like, "Does that happen?" I, and I'll say this, Andy. I swear to God, yeah. you played hockey, man, growing up. We would chirp each other so fucking hard. But if I play with a guy and all of a sudden he came up to me on a face-off after he got traded or I got traded and he's like, your wife's a fucking peg or your f- wife's fat, which she's only 100 pounds. But if she's if your wife, I'd be like, what the fuck did you just say to me? What? I beat guys for all kinds of different shit. Mm-hmm. For being a fucking this, for being that, whatever. I got chirped for a million. But if you know the guy's wife and you were teammates with him, and you chirped them on the ice, you would lose your mind. Now, that didn't happen here. But I've never, I, I just, they're, they're just the, the, the locker room talk goes so far. I don't get me wrong. But beacon other people's wives that you actually played with and know is is to a different level. And it doesn't happen that much in a hockey world, All to right, be honest. Listen, there's two, there's there's right. different ways you to break this down. Yeah, no, there's two different ways, no and, doubt. And to look at it. Go ahead, go ahead. Like what he said about a teammate's wife it's tough. is it's tough to deal with. About as bad of a thing as you could do in terms of trying to walk back into a dressing room. Holy you would know better than I would. Fucking shit. I mean, yeah, what's dude. everybody saying from the Capitals Holy. to each other right now? Like, oh. like, is this dude serious? Plus, he, I think he chirped his teammates yeah, too. Yeah, and I get the right? way time out, Andy. With that, it's fine. Although there's a little bit more different meaning. Now you chirp each other's teammate, and the people are right. going, like, "Kim, you chirp." Each-. Yeah, no shit. But to you each can, other's you face. can maybe move past that. To a, you can move past that. Bunch of nerds. Yeah, mm-hmm. they probably were nerdy. Mm-hmm. Okay, mm-hmm. they probably were nerdy. Right. I call you a nerd every fucking day. Whatever. That's fine. We love each other. <laughs> now I get that. Yeah. There's a little bit deeper meaning to it when you're doing it to a different teammate. Now, if there was the same teammate that you're chirping, you're, the same team that you're, right. you're on, okay, it's different. But if it's a t- guy from Vancouver and then you're chirping the Ottawa guys that you play for or whoever team you pay for, it's a little different. I don't give a fuck but about didn't that. Didn't he say something about his line mates, his I, own line mates? Yeah, they're nerdy, whatever the fuck. I don't care. But when you play with a guy, a fucking kid, and his 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 wife. No, we get they're, that. They're, so what's... That fuck you is fucking okay. horrible. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Okay. So what do you get? What do you talk? What's the question? One hundred percent. Okay. And and some of the other stuff. What what I don't understand. And listen, we talked about this before. I'm not about to sit here and condone anything he said. Just just go. It's not. It's it's not about. They get us by now. Go ahead. What he said. I just don't understand how a private message gets leaked out. Who are you talking to that would hate you that badly? That they would leak They're out ruined. your comments, I know. especially comments of this nature. How does that happen? I don't know. That's the mystery of this whole thing. Great question on that. And that's why I prefaced it by saying, is that the word? Preface? Mm. It doesn't matter. Prefaced. Prefaced. By say- I went to school. By saying, if anybody in this fucking room, if anybody anywhere, and don't you act like, I know my text message oh. fell, shut the fuck up. <laughs> If anybody clipped, I can go through your phone, mm-hmm. your phone, your phone. Anybody who's listening right now, I could go through your phone. I could nit. I don't have comments like Shut that. Shut up! Well, I know. Not about no, a no, no, friend's no. wife. I, doesn't matter. No, no, no. I'm not saying that, Andy. I just said that. We don't do that. Mm-hmm. But there's other shit, and there's shit of mine, no doubt. And oh, if yeah. they clipped that off and they said, "Look what Cam said to that his you buddy," you wouldn't want out. Fuck no! And don't you give me that high. I don't know. I don't do. Get out of here. So listen, get I out of here. I put a tweet up today, and I knew it was dangerous to put it up because no, gotta, everyone tries to um, twist your words around yep. and yeah, they do. and 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 make it out that like I'm approving what he said. But what I said was, and I'm not talking about just professional athletes. Anybody. 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 What would the world look like, honestly? How would people? You. If everybody's private conversations and private messages and text messages became public, there you go. Even for one day, how many lives would get ruined? Thank you. 
if those became public and people are like, oh, I see where you're coming from. You're disappointed. I'm like, oh, Shut my God. So up. I took the tweet down because Jeez. people. Did you really? Yeah. You pussy. Well, no, because like. Fuck it. You do that too you much. You can't defend yourself on Twitter and people try to make. They try to twist your words around I, to say something. You knew that was coming, though, Andy. No, you, but I, we talked I, about it. I'm trying to create conversation for people to say, hey. Fuck. For people you to. You took it down? Yeah. Fuck that. It's a fucking... It's a, no, no, no. You didn't fuck up on that. Now, if I... People can be like, well, you can. I'm sure you said... I'm like, what? Okay, I fucking said stupid shit, like, I'm man. Not, I do. It's such a touchy subject. It's so touchy, and, but... And sometimes I think to myself, oh my God, what did I just do? I'm not no, saying... You're I'm good. not you're approving squeaky what he said. You're squeaky clean, though. <laughs> That's a legit question to ask people. Why can't people understand that? They can't on Twitter. And I, I warned you about that. I go, put it up. But people are going to get you. But you didn't. You didn't you, say that. Yes, I did. Oh, now he fucking Motherfucker. You never, you never Look at the that. text messages we're going to post again. I'm going to ruin your fucking ass now. <laughs> I did say that. And I go, don't. I'll post your text messages. <laughs> don't you. I'm just. Look. But when you're chirping. So so there's both sides of the story, guys. And and, and I know not too many people are touching up on this thing. And we're going to do it. And I don't give a shit. Because it's, it's reality and it happened. This kid played for five different teams. There's something going on anyway. But the way he was talking about his teammates, I'm like. You must have been a motherfucking loner because you don't like a lot of guys on that team. Right. There's a couple guys in my crew I didn't like. Not many, but I'm friends with everybody on that team. Like, And I was fucking wild, and the guys chirped me, but I would never... Like, it fucking guys... Fu- fa- oh, I, I, don't, I don't know, man. But here's the, I said here, some here, stupid here, shit, it, too. Don't here, get me wrong. Here's the reality still of the situation. Do. He's not good enough to overcome this, in Fuck my opinion. no, And Andy. to no, still no. find a career in the National Hockey League. I can't see him going into any dressing room. Who's the kid he made? Who's the kid's wife he made? What's the guy's name? Tanner Pearson. Okay, listen. Who apparently, talking to another NHL player today, he said, I don't really know him personally, but talking to other guys, he apparently is a great guy. Super nice guy. Really oh, Tanner's, well liked. Tanner's a nice really guy? Really well liked. Oh, yeah, Tanner. Jesus. So people are going to have his back and whatever. And the poor, poor girl, his poor wife. Oh and, and now it's blown up. And the picture's everywhere. And, and it's a picture by where Tanner's after a game. And his kids are there. And his wife. And, and she's like, oh my. It's like this. The whole thing was confusing. I, I couldn't even it, figure out what was going if on. If I'm fucking Tanner Pearson, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to look at I'm gonna be like Gary Bettman. Don't you just, don't you suspend him. No, 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 no. No, make, I want him to make a team. I'm going to fucking... Pavel Burry, Shane Churla, that motherfucker, so fucking hard. And I'm going to eat a 20-game suspension. Mm. I got money saved up. I don't give a fuck. You fuck, my, you fuck with my wife like that? I'm going to fucking get you, and I'm going to eat that suspension. That's just me. <laughs> I'm not a sensitive guy. You could chirp me. You could chirp my fucking parents. I chirp my fucking parents. They're hillbillies, and they live next to me, and they created me, and I'm fucked. I get that. <laughs> you chirp my wife who takes care like. The, like my wife, who's like the most, like even keel, loves everything. Like you fucking chirp her. Let me ask you I'm going to kill you. Is there Fuck. any part of you that feels bad for yes. Brendan Leipzig? Yes, 100%. Yeah, good, great question. Damn right I feel bad for him a little bit. I've said stupid You can ass never shit. say that publicly. I've said, I'm saying it publicly now. I know, I'm just saying. People come after you. They're going to come after me. I feel bad for him a little bit. He's, I, would I not kill him? I just said if I'm, I'm gonna, I'll, I'm gonna fuck you up, and you're gonna be sitting in your room, and you're not gonna open the shades up because you're concussed, and I'm gonna have you spinning for five months. Think about this. I'm gonna squ- hurt you. The squeak. But I feel bad for you a little bit. Too. Cleanest athletes in professional sports today, and we all know who they are on the hockey side. The, the Tom Brady's of the world. Yeah. These these people. Yeah. Well, he's. I love him, but yeah, I'm man. just saying, Derek yeah. Jeter. Oh my Sydney. Come on. Could you imagine going Said into the their private conversations? I bet you may find something that will okay, surprise Andy, you. Andy. Okay. If, 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 but again, that's why it's called private. That's exactly. And not public. Why are they on social media doing that? Why don't you do a text chain? Like, it, why in so, social media that? scares what me? Was it? I think it was fucking Instagram, like, or mm. something. No, 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 no. It, no, it was a private message. Like, you know how you could private message each other on Facebook and whatnot? Yeah. I fucking shady as shit about that. Like, I'm shady about texting you once in a while. But the point is, if anybody out there is like, oh, I'm looking at my text message right now. Oh, you can take it in. Fuck you. Shut the fuck up. I can nitpick any one of those. And point out, like, look what he said about, I don't know who it was, but look, I, there's no context. Here we go. Now, there, you don't need to have context with what they said. We know what the fuck they're talking about, okay? But those conversations, it made me feel like I was in juniors again. These guys are 25 years old. Let, let me let me, let me press it, preface it. I know that word. Let me, let me say this. Preface it. Preface it. Whatever. When you're in juniors, you say stupid things in the locker room, especially when you're 17, 18. You're, you're, 
you're weird around girls because you're finally getting attention for the first time. Maybe you made money for the first time. You don't, you don't know how to act around them. You're 17, you're 18, you're 19, you're 20. You're just figuring out who you are. But when you're 25 and you have conversations like that, fucking pig, fuck yeah. Where's the fat bras? I'm going to fucking, tr- I'm going to fucking, bl- no, why? What? When you're in fucking juniors, you talk shit like that and it's still bad. But when you're 25 years old, You've been in the NHL for five years and you're fucking, I'm going to go to a bar to make fun of fat women? Are you fucking stupid? You treat them like gold. And if they all love you, it makes you look that much better. But you're going to make, that is insanity to me. Mm -hmm. And he fucked up. But again, to your question, do I feel sorry, bad, that that got leaked? (laughs) Yeah, a little bit. Well, because look, look, a little bit, man. His life got turned upside down. A little bit, man. Not going to lie to you. Pretty fast. The NHL came out with a statement. I know they did. You know, I mean, oh, here's another thing. Of a story. Oh, here's another thing, too, by the way. That, that, that this is. So, you know, I, I I had to get a statement out, and I wanted to do it myself one time, and I they they wouldn't let me. I'd like to hold a press conference. Fuck this! I want to be real. I sound like a fucking robot You're dropping f bombs. No, no, no. I sound like a robot when the team does it for you. He sounds like a robot. If I'm him, I'd come out and be like, I don't care about. I'm not playing for another initial team anyway. I'm gonna I'm gonna be real. And I'm going to write this out. I'm going to do a video. I fuck that. I'm not writing shit. I'm going to do a video. Put a fucking camera in my face. Here we go. I just want to let everybody know. I fucked up. I'm a fucking asshole. I'm a fucking pig. And I fucked up. I treated those girls like shit. Should I did not this. use the word pig. Well, he said pig. That's uh, why I brought oh, it up. Okay. I said, I'm a pig uh, for telling them they're okay. a pig. Just making sure. Damn it, Andy. I, I was on a roll. Go back to your press my conference. My point is, my press conference. Here's a I would belittle myself so bad. Instead of being like, I am so sorry for everything. I am a robot. My team is writing this. I am at fuck you. Talk to the camera I'm and be a man. To my family, I'm to my sorry teammates, to my am, to I my am neighbors, fuck the ice you. cream man. I'm yeah, sorry fuck. to my second grade teacher. You look in that and camera and be a man. Go be a man <laughs> and look into the camera. I know. It's, I, I, you get I my point on that? that? Okay. But you get my point on that. But you know, from you, a legal standpoint, I don't know. A lot of times, teams know, and uh, PR people, man, they'd better. Legal standpoint, what are they going to sue you for? Like, I, I don't know. I don't Maybe know. anybody can sue you for anything. Brendan Leipzig. How about you just you think be your a life man. is You think your life is tough today? Think about Brendan Leipzig. <laughs> but he brought this on he himself. I mean, come on. Thinking it's private. You always bring everything on yourself, man. Everything I've ever done bad is if on you myself. Were, if you were involved in this situation, who, who do you think is more angry? Tanner Pearson or Brendan Leipzig? Like, oh, you think boy. Leipzig wants to kill the person oh, who yeah. leaked it There's gonna be couple- more than Tanner Pearson wants to kill Brendan Leipzig? Yeah. I mean, you still said it, so you got to be like, yeah, that motherfucker. But He's you probably know what, called I'm Tanner dude. Pearson if by I'm, now. Oh, my God. I would call him. Dude, I'm I so could, I'd sorry. Fly, I'd fly out so there. I'm so sorry. I'd fly out there back. I fucked up. I, I'm a outside fucking Outside of his house, idiot. keeping social distance. I'm a fucking Six idiot. feet away. Like, I fucked up. I was being cocky. I was being rude. I was drunk. I'm fucking sorry. I'm a fucking idiot. I'm sorry. No, he said he was. Now he's like, was he? Do, was he doing? Was he doing blow or something? Was that what he was doing? Yeah, I don't know. He insinuated Maybe. he was don't, high. You're or something. throwing fucking blow in the mix. Like, let's not do that. He already fucked up enough. Don't throw a fucking yak in the well, mix. Well, apparently he said he was high or something. I don't know. Yeah, what kind of high? You smoke a bowl? Who gives a shit? You're fucking <laughs> blowing lines and you're fucking talking. What? It doesn't even matter. It doesn't even fucking matter. Okay. It doesn't even matter. Hey, this is Go a great. Be a man. This is a great lead-in for uh, Ed Belfort, by the way. Oh yeah. <laughs> Hey, Eddie, send me that uh, Eddie, hope you enjoy coming on with us. We want some whiskey. That Stanley Cup, baby. Uh, Belfour Spirits is what it's yeah, called. Dude. Dude. Fuck yeah. I want my own spirit company. Good for you. Like my I got buddy my own beer. Has I got it. my own beer, baby. Uh, he's got the uh, Stanley Cup chalice at the top of the whiskey. The Andy Strickland beer? What's that going to look like? <laughs> Better than <laughs> your beer. Like- you don't even drink it. This is the Andy Strickland beer. The Cam here. Jansen beer. You it's, walk around with no it. There's no alcohol in it, by the way. You walk around with it. Like it means something to you. I make money off yeah. it. <laughs> How much? I don't know. I paid for, I less paid for the, the house payment. So fuck you. Does it? I mean, yeah, kind of. For what? one month. <laughs> we might as well tell people you actually do have a beer. Yeah, I do. I where, got a lot of things Where can going they on. get it? In Eureka? Uh, they can get it in any uh, nobody else in wants St. Louis. It. I mean, it's, it's unbelievable. It's everywhere. It's every schnooks, and uh, you know, got a lot of things going on. Andy Strickland got a lot of things going on. That a boy, yeah. All right, including Eddie Belfour. Damn right, baby. This dude was a legend. Great player. If you grew up in the '90s, man, you either loved Eddie Belfour, you hated Eddie Belfour. A lot of your, memories. Your dad dumped a beer on him one time. In I don't St. know. St. Louis, too, man. For 
him just going crazy, just getting trucked by Bobby Probert too. Oh yeah, Proby. Oh, oh, who sent that out? Kimby, Darren Kimball sent that out. Today. I think they're tight. They're buddies. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're like he may Proby he maybe even name them. drops yeah. Darren Kimball on this episode. He does. Kimby gets a little sh- good. Fucking let Kimby get a shout yes. out. He was a bad motherfucker. Hmm. Doesn't get enough attention in uh, St. Louis, by the way. I was a big fan of Darren Kimball when I was a kid. I liked Oh, I was going to say, well, not now? <laughs> <laughs> He's like, cool as shit. No, I liked him. I liked him back in the oh, day. Oh, I love Kimby's the fucking coolest cat, man. Like, this does yeah. his shit was he bad was, to the he bone, was tough, baby. Man. He was tough, Played love for him. Quebec, too, man. Yeah. All right. Uh, at Belfort. Enjoy this one. Brought to you by a normal brand. That's where we're at today. Come on by. Check it out. Let them come to you. Yeah. Create a store in your own driveway. Of course, Bellman.com. B E H L M A N N dot com. I knew that. They got the Cadillac, the Buick GMC. I'm waiting for my Escalade, as you know. You, I don't know if you're cool enough for that. Oh, I, I can complete, do it. Completely Chrysler Dodge you. Jeep Ram right across the street. Again, Bellman.com. Get yourself some new wheels before the weather gets Ooh, hot. How about a Jeep with no. Uh, how about going down the lake? Jeep, pack a cooler in the back. Until you get down there, you start drinking. When you get down there, don't get me wrong. But you had the wind, uh, the doors <laughs> off. You have the feet hanging out. The wind's coming okay. at you. I'm trying to save my yeah. ass when I'm saying pack a cooler in the back to go to the lake. I'm just letting you know. Got it. But having a Jeep there, you think you're going to escalate. Probably not going to happen. Watch me, dude. Probably not going to happen. Watch. Probably not going to happen. It's going to be your wife's. Well, she would look good in it anyway. She would look a lot cooler than you in there. But you can get a Jeep, a pink one, like you said I should get. Mm-hmm. But with I could pull that off and you can't. With two doors. And small wheels. Small. Oh, give me those small wheels, baby. <laughs> I want them small wheels. All right, cope24.com as well. Check them out, www.cope24.com. All right, Eddie the Eagle, Belfour, Hall of Famer. This dude brings it, too. Enjoy it, episode 37. What's up, big boy? Not much. Just taking it easy today. What does that mean? Uh, that means phone calls, emails. Um, planning for the barrels that we're getting ready to put some whiskey in. Mm. Yeah, your life's way more exciting than Cam's, I'll tell you that. Settle down, Andy, <laughs> fuck's sakes. <laughs> What's new, man? Everything else good with you? Yeah, yeah, we're doing good. We're staying busy. Um, I still work out every day. You know, got to stay in shape, right? <laughs> Do you? <laughs> get, get, get ready for that pond hockey game coming up eventually. Well, you're going to do some sort of I, – I, I bet you get invited to all kinds of different alumni events and things like that. So you've got to kind of stay in shape. Are you one of those goalies that – like Marty Berdor a little bit? And I'm going to chirp Marty a little bit here. That will get invited to some of these things, but they play out instead of goal. You're still a goalie, right, Eddie? <laughs> no. I haven't put on the pad since my last game pro. Really? Uh, I think most of us, after we're done playing, we, we like to play forward and snipe a few here and there. I don't blame you. I couldn't imagine being a goaltender, Eddie, for years, especially as long as you played and were actually good, you know, like a real world-class goaltender, and then be like, okay, I'm going to go back on the ice, and I'm going to put all the equipment back on. Oh, my groin. <laughs> and then go play goal and let people rip slap shots at me. No thanks. Yeah, it's bad enough in, in, you know, all those years in practice and, you know, guys ripping them by your ears, but uh, after you're done playing, that's the last thing you want to do is on a pond hockey game with <laughs> Let all the shinny guys rip them on you. You'd well, probably you'd probably kill somebody anyway if they if they if they came up close to your neck, head, right in the neck. Be like, okay, my pond hockey career is over. Didn't last long. <laughs> <laughs> Do you get? Pissed? Yeah, it's a lot. It's a lot more fun to play out, and, and it only takes about five minutes to warm up when you play out. For me, when I play goal, you know, it was like a one hour to an hour and a half ordeal just trying to get warmed up so I could be flexible enough. Yeah, I mean the flexibility part of being a goalie. Like, good God, every time I, I and of course we know you had we had you on, and I'm like watching all your highlights. And I'm like, up oh, there goes my hip flexor. Up oh, there goes my growing. There goes my fucking glute. There goes how the hell like, were you flexible as a kid? Because be, playing goal, like in order to be successful, you got to do the splits. So how would you get that flexible? Was it just natural? No, I was not natural at all. I had to work at it, and uh, throughout most of my career, I I did uh, Pilates and yoga. And that helped tremendously. And, um, you know, for me, I could never do the full splits. I could do uh, three quarters, but ne- never the full splits. And I always try to stay away from that move. So they never pull a hamstring or a growing. So uh, not too many flashy saves like that for me. I beg to differ on that. But you, you're talking about Pilates and yoga. 
But back in the early '90s, nobody you, was doing. Like, that. were you like, "Fuck, were you like, guys, no, guys, I'm not going to the, no, no, wait, Modo, I'm not going to the bar. I'm going to Pilates real quick." And all, with all the boys, like, "What the fuck, Pilates?" <laughs> yeah, they were. They laughed at me a little bit, but you know, they realized you know how much effort and uh, focus I put into the game to help us try to win. And uh, you know, it all paid off in '99 when we won the cup together, and uh, you know, that was a dream come true. So you know, all those sacrifices that you put in pay off eventually. Yeah, there's no doubt. Holly probably joined you in Pilates class, I'm sure. <laughs> oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> hey, man, listen, I don't understand. Like, your career, it makes zero sense to me, just so you know. Like, I, I don't get it. Like, you, Why? Well, because you had an unreal career. You win the Vesna as a rookie, and you come out of college. You win a NCAA national championship. Your only year you played college – what were you doing? Why were you such a late bloomer? How come you went undrafted? I don't, I don't understand how people could miss on players of your caliber. Yeah, I think it happened a lot more back in, in those days. Uh, it, you know, there's quite a few really good players that uh, were uh, overlooked, and I was one of them. And uh, for me, I didn't start playing goal till I was 12. And uh, growing up in a little town, um, you know, I didn't really have the opportunity to go play at Tier 1 in the Western League. Um, you know, we had a tier, couple Tier 2 teams that were close by, and, uh, you know, we all played uh, Provincial uh, A uh, hockey. So Provincial A hockey was never really looked at as any good players in there, very few. And um, just as I got older, like I didn't even make our high school hockey team. Um, I was cut from that and almost took a uh, basketball up at that point and I'm glad I didn't of course um, but anyway I ended up making the Winkler Flyers uh, tier two junior hockey team uh, provincial junior A in uh, Manitoba there and played three years there and uh, I always wanted to play for the Fighting Sioux at North Dakota and they would come down and watch uh, for those uh, first uh, three years there when I was playing in Winkler and uh, Gino Gasparini he happened to see me play one night in soccer when I stood on my head I think I had 50 some shots and we won 2-1 so that pretty much sealed the deal for uh, for Gino uh, bringing me into North Dakota and that was where I wanted to be so uh, it was an uh, awesome experience and uh, we went 40 wins 8 losses that year at North Dakota winning the NCAA and they called our team the dream team wow Cam didn't make his high school team either. I, fuck, just that so was you a know. joke I was going to say to you, you dick. <laughs> Damn it. He, he, he acts like he's going to go next so he could he could throw a chirp at me. I knew he uh, was going to say that about me, Eddie. I wasn't going to let that happen. <laughs> yeah, you got to be ahead of him, right? <laughs> got to be ahead of the game. I was going to ask you this. So, you know, you didn't start till a late age, 12 years old. Like, God, that, that, like I started hockey at, at, at 10. I thought that was late. But starting goalie, like, how do you stick out? Like, being a goaltender is so difficult. And I, I try to tell people that, too. Like, you know, first period, you go down, a guy rips a, a bomb past your shoulder. All of a sudden, one shot, one goal. Like, how devastating is that for your, your, your you know, your mindset as a goaltender? Like, how do you, how do you stick out? How do you deal with the pressure as being a goalie like that? I mean, it's got to be very, very difficult. Yeah, when you're uh, in your younger years, for me, you know, you give up a bad goal like that, or, or even if it was a good goal, one shot, one goal, and uh, yeah, it can play definitely hard on your mind and you know you're wondering if you're you're good enough and you know a lot of goalies let's let that get to them and they can't recover from it and that's where the top uh, professional athletes in the world we all make mistakes as you know and it's the ones that can recover from making the mistakes and still have that positive mindset and I think I was always really strong-minded and very determined very competitive which you know god-given talent thank you very much and that's what helped me through all those times. I just never give up. And, you know, I hated to lose too. So I just kept at it and, you know, just, uh, you know, always told myself I can do whatever I put my mind to doing. And even if I gave up some bad goals, I, I knew the team still needed me. And you still have to come up with the big saves to try and help the team win. So, you know, over the years, obviously, you get better at it. So when you first came into Chicago, and, and like I said, I mean, you win the, the Calder Trophy and the Vesna. And Good you were a finalist for the Hart Trophy for the MVP. Just an unbelievable <sighs> season for you. What allowed you to adjust so quickly and be so comfortable? And, I mean, playing with like Dominic Hasek and some of these guys, I want to get into that, what that was like. But 
Just in terms of the adjustment to the National Hockey League, Eddie, why did it seem so easy for you, even though it probably wasn't? Yeah, so um, I look back on it, and um, my first year of training camp in Chicago, uh, you know, I sucked in training camp and and um, just was off with my timing. And, and you know, that, that whole big difference from going from college to uh, – to the NHL and I got sent to the minors Saginaw Michigan in oh, the yeah. old IHL oh, yeah. and um, I played my my whole first year there and was co-rookie of the year with John Cullen and um, learned a lot about the pro game the fr- I think if, if I remember right the first two months I, I think I had maybe a, a few wins and uh, a lot of losses and I think they were probably wondering who is this guy he sucks you know but um you, know, you just keep working hard at it and you learn from your mistakes. And uh, by the end of the year, I was co-rookie of the year. And then next year, I went to Chicago and I was better in training camp, still not good enough, got sent back uh, to Saginaw. I was up and down that year, I, I want to say like eight or nine times. Uh, that was the era when uh, Mike Keenan was calling guys up and down. And I think Cam Russell had the record of like 12 or 13 times. <laughs> oh, yeah. Amazing, you know. And so – that year, um, I did get a chance to play in the NHL, and, and I did okay, uh, but still not ready. And third year, they sent me uh, to Team Canada. I traveled all over the world playing, you know, different events and, uh, you know, different countries. And, you know, experiencing the world was, a, was a, at the time, maybe kind of a pain because they were like two-month road trips. But looking back on it, it was, it was great to see the world. But that three years I sent, spent in the minors was uh, the best thing that could have happened to me. It helped me, uh, you know, adjust my game and learn the pro game, uh, get my equipment all squared away. And when I got my chance uh, that year in the spring in the playoffs, uh, Keenan threw me in a game um, against Minnesota. We were playing them in the first round, and we were down three games to one in the series and three nothing at the end of the first period of that game and he came over and kicked me in the ribs and said you're in kid so i you know in between period i get ready and you know warming up and you know of course this is my big chance and went in there and shut him out and we ended up winning that game and uh, all that time i spent in the minors helped prepare me for that opportunity and i played the next game tied the series up i uh, did not play game seven uh, Greg Millen was a veteran uh, goalie then on our team, and he played game seven. We won game seven, went on to St. Louis second round. I played all seven games second round, uh, went to the third round. Uh, we beat St. Louis second round. We went to the third round against Edmonton, and I played the first game and uh, lost, uh, I think it was 5-2, and uh, we ended up losing the series. I didn't play any games after that. We lost the series. They went on and won the cup. But uh, all that time in the minors just helped me uh, tremendously, both from a mindset, uh, from a preparation for the pro game and getting my equipment squared away. And, uh, you know, the next year I played 75 games, I think it was, or 75 starts. Uh, Keenan, of course. Oh, yeah. Iron Mike Keenan. We're going to get in that. We had oh, him I, on. I hope, yeah, we had him on the podcast, by the way, too. Hopefully he didn't kick you too hard because that's like frowned upon these days when he told you to go in. We're not going to get into that. But you did mention a couple things, and I want to I want to break a couple things down for you real quick uh, uh, with you here. Playing in the minors as a goalie. Did you play three and three? Like, people don't get how hardcore it is down the minors. Yeah. That was hard, right? Three, three, that three on the road. <laughs> on the road and a 2 o'clock game on a Sunday. And you're like, yeah. Fuck. That yeah. you become a man then, and then you understand oh, yeah. the schedule. It's easier in the NHL then, right? Oh yeah, big time. Yeah, I- and one other thing too, I wanted to ask you about your equipment. You said you kept bringing up you getting your equipment ready. Like what as a goal, for, as a player, yeah, your stick needs to be right, your curve needs to be right. All I needed was a right handed stick. To be completely honest with you, he didn't need a stick. Okay, thank you, Andy. But the point is, with a goalie though, <laughs> explain the equipment situation for you and on how you had to get it right for you to feel comfortable in that. Yeah, it's a uh, it's it's a feeling when you put like a new glove on, and it's mainly the gloves and uh, the pads. I never switched out my arm pads. Once I got them broken in, I you try to wear them forever because it just took forever to to break those things in. But uh, for me, it was the glove. Uh, you'd put on a new glove, and and you could tell almost right away if it just it felt nice. It was balanced and you go on the ice and catch a few and you could just tell like it just went right into the pocket perfect it didn't bounce out it didn't hurt your hand 
you know, it wasn't always like that with every glove. And so same thing with the pads. Um, I always called it magic pads. Whenever I got a set of pads that I put on, I went up for a practice and I, I could just stop everything. I'm like, yeah, these freaking pads are working awesome. You know, they're my magic pads. And then I'd break in another set so that I'd always save the magic pads for special games because, you know, they, or, you know, the later part of the season going into the playoffs, uh, you know, the stuff doesn't last as long as you'd wish it would. But uh, the equipment for me, my skates, it all had to be perfect. And when it was perfect, that, you know, that's when you'd see, you know, two or three shutouts in a row and stuff like that. And, you know, you go, go on those huge winning streaks and, um, you know, have a great playoff series. All right. So what was Dominic Hoshik like? I mean, we've had guys on the podcast who oh, play yeah. with them who, I mean, just destroyed, didn't like crushed him. this guy. Like they did not like Dominic Hoshik. What was your relationship with him like? And were you, were you surprised that he went on to have a Hall of Fame career as well? Well, Dominic and I started together as rookies in Chicago. So, uh, and along with Jimmy Waite, uh, Chris Clifford, and John Reed, we were kind of the younger guys. Uh, and Jimmy Waite was the first round draft pick. I think he was the eighth or ninth overall pick. Uh, he won MVP of the first training camp that we were in. I, I got sent to the minors. He went back to juniors. Uh, you know, back then, uh, the guys, uh, young draft picks couldn't go play in, in the minors, they had to go back to junior. And um, Dominic was uh, very unorthodox, as I was too. You know, kind of, you know, just do whatever it takes to stop the puck. Uh, um, he was uh, really quiet, obviously, uh, from a different country. And, um, you know, he uh, was uh, not a big fitness guy. I was a big fitness guy. Uh, you know, worked out every day in the gym. And, you know, it really, I think, helped me play that many years that I played in the NHL. Uh, but Dominic and I always had this uh, silent competition uh, with each other uh, back then. You know, it started in training camps, obviously. And, um, you know, I always had the mindset that I was the best and I wanted to be the best. So Dominic and I always competed against one another. I think it made us both better. Uh, you know, I, I saw right away from, from the start he had great focus on the puck. Uh, as everyone knows, you can see that from the first time. Uh, playing against him and then um, you know I was in a situation he was in a situation we both want to be number one guys and you know they kept me thank goodness and they they let Dominic go and he went on to have a great career and I I didn't think it was going to be any different he was a competitive guy and, and has great focus on the puck uh, anytime you have that focus on the puck and and that uncanny uh, ability to know where it's going to be at the right time which he has, and uh, all the greats do. Um, you know, it was a, uh, it was uh, very nice to see him in the finals in '99. Uh, you know, it was a time where uh, he was touted as the best goalie ever, and, and this and that. And, and for me, uh, you know, that was all I needed to hear was that yeah. everyone was touting him better than me. And I, yep. I had a lot, of, I had a lot to prove anyway. Mm. So, yeah, you had a great team too. And, and, and that was a, that was a, a great battle and, and to be able to kind of come back together and play against each other. And for you to come up on top was a, was a big deal, but I want to get into the competition aspect. Uh, and I've been through this too, Eddie, like, you know, I'm a fourth line guy. Lou Lamarillo always would have another tough guy on the team where we, we they, they force you to become, competitive with each other and a lot of times people take that competition and they don't you know they don't get rid of it away from the rink and so they you're just completely competitive with this guy and you force them not like each other so explain that as a, especially as a goalie to have that competitive level with other people trying to take your job when you know there's only two spots available it kind of forces you not to like your teammate kind of yeah it does uh, it can be a, a tough situation especially on, on teams where uh, the backup goalie doesn't really want to accept uh, his role and his position. And, um, you know, it can cause the, the splitting up of a team because, you know, you got, you, you got the main core group of guys that all support one another and you got, you know, other guys that support sometimes the backup goalie and, you know, the backup goalie's, you know, a bit of a politician and that can cause problems. Uh, I never had that problem with Dominic. He he was a he was a very uh, proud guy, but uh, you know he 
worked hard and and kept his his mouth to where you know where he was responsible with what he said to his teammates. Uh, I believe that he was always trying to help us win. Uh, Roman Turek was the same way when we won a cup in '99. Uh, but you're right. Uh, I've been on teams where uh, the coach is, you know, pushing, you know, for the backup to maybe take the the starter's job. Yep. And 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 guys see that on the team, and and they're like, "What the hell's going on?" Like that's it, it just disrupts the whole team, and 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 you know, of course, it, you're never going to win with a team like that. You got to have one guy that's, you know the number one goalie and your backup goalie's got to be there to be ready to play whenever he's called upon and support the team, support the starting goalie. And that's when you have, you know, that camaraderie from top to bottom with the whole team. Um, you know, a lot of my friends uh, on the teams I played on over the years, uh, uh, like Mike Peluso, uh, Darren Kimball, tough guys. Oh, and, Kimby. Oh yeah. We know Kimby yeah. out here. And, um, and uh, Ty Domi, you know, those, those guys, you know, they were, they, you're exactly right. Like they, they had in their mindset, like, you know, this is, uh, this is my role. This is my job. This is my team. I'm defending my teammates. And, you know, I, I saw the manip- manipulation sometimes uh, when we were in Chicago. And, um, you know, I didn't really like that because we had a lot of tough guys in Chicago and, and back then in training camps, uh, you know, we'd have three a days and, you know, every, every time you stepped on the ice was your proving ground. And for those tough guys, they had to fight like almost every scrimmage, you know, they're fighting for their job. And it was, that was the way it was back then. Um, and, and the same thing in, you know, exhibition games, you know, we're skating around in the warm up, and, and guys are dead silent getting dressed before, you know, go out, going out on the ice because they knew, you know, it was going to be an all out battle in the warm ups. Uh, you know, big rivalries back then, like the Detroit Red Wings and Minnesota North Stars and the Maple Leafs. You know, we St. Louis Blues. You know, we it was a battle every uh, every warm up, every game, and uh, you know, you played a lot of games against one another. So um, my hats, my hat was always off to the, to the tough guys. Uh, they were, you know, like I said, some of my best friends, and. Um, you know, I just respected those guys so much and, and felt bad for them when they were manipulated like that. So what about when you're older, though, and you're proven and they bring in the young guy? Like, I don't imagine just listening to you and watching your career that you you were looking to slide over and make room for anybody. So when a young guy like Marty Turco comes on board in Dallas, what's that like for a guy like you who probably felt like, listen, I'm still on top of my game and I've got a lot of hockey I'm left in me. Yep. I'm the man. Yeah, that's that's what I was talking about earlier. That can be a tough situation, uh, you know. For for myself, it was. Um, you know, Marty was a, a great goalie and uh, had a great career. Um, you know, he was hungry. He was chomping at the bit. You know, I just uh, won the cup in '99 and went to the finals again in 2000. So I was, you know, in the prime of my career. I wasn't ready to hang him up or you know, play, you know, 30 games or anything like that. Uh, so that was definitely a difficult time. And, uh, you know, it came to a head and they decided to keep Marty and let me go to, to uh, Toronto. I ended up signing as a free agent in Toronto, which, um, you know, you try to look at every situation as a positive. And for me, I always did that very well. Um, I went to Toronto and, and really enjoyed my time there. Um, but if, you know, if, if I wasn't let go, I never would have gotten that opportunity. Hey, Cam, if I gave you the option to buy a car, you can either go to the dealership or you can buy it from your house, from the crib. Oh, my God, Andy Bellman. They make it so easy for you. They'll come to you, not to mention they'll have videos of, of any car that you want. They'll, they'll go right through it. They'll show you the ins and outs of everything, make it completely simple for you. And uh, I tell you what, they're great people to work with. They've been in the game a long time, Andy. They're huge hockey fans. They do a lot of charity work in this city, and they make it comfortable for you to go buy a car at Bellman. Exactly. And we're dealing with a pandemic. Cam didn't know that, but everybody else knows we're dealing with a real pandemic. This is serious stuff. And so that's why they're making an adjustment to make life as easy for you. Because people out there still need transportation. People out there were still planning on buying cars. Doesn't mean that you have to put that on hold. The NHL season's on pause. 
but your car aspirations don't need to be. www.bellman.com. You can email them. You can text them. They've got so many different ways. And, again, they will do a virtual uh, meeting with you where they'll walk around cars. They'll show you the exterior. They'll show you the interior. Answer any questions you may have about the engine or the performance. And great lease deals. You can buy a new car, pre-owned deals as well. And, again, if you're a current Bellman customer, listen up to this as well. Because they will come to you with a nice, clean loaner car, all sanitized. You don't have to worry about the the big germs because they took care of it. They cleaned it all up for you. They'll leave you with the loaner car, take your car back to the shop, service it up for you, and then deliver it back to you. That's what I call service, Cam Jansen. They make it too easy, Andy. Everybody's going to start doing this kind of stuff now. They're innovative. Uh, they're great people. Check them out. Bellman. Bellman.com. If you can't get there, they'll come to you. Again, Bellman, Buick, Cadillac, GMC, or right across the street, Chrysler, Dodge, Jeep, Ram, Bellman Automotive Group, proud sponsor and big-time supporter of what we're doing here on the Cam and Strick podcast. www.bellman.com. It's always good to make a stop in Toronto, by the way. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I wish I would have made a stop in Toronto just to, to be a part of their alumni. You know, it's like you're just in a mecca of everything. But, you know, me watching, I, mean, I was born in 84. Like, ni- the 90s hockey was my thing. That's how I got into it. I'm from St. Louis, man. I, hockey wasn't gigantic here by any stretch of imagination. But 90s hockey was so big. And I wanted to ask you, all the superstars you played against at the time, Yogs, Lemieux, you got the Big E cruising around who was just on the podcast the other day. Who threatened you the most as far as skill set's concerned, though, Eddie? Like, as far as coming down and doing something goofy to where it just gets you off your toes and you're like, what? Where am I at? Like, what guy? Like, It, it might not even be a, a big superstar, but somebody that just kind of worried you when you played against them. Well, Yager was definitely one of the best. And, um, you know, he put on a clinic there when we were in the finals against Pittsburgh in 92. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so that was a that was a tough goal for for the Blackhawks for myself, and I looked I watched that video I think it was like a couple of months ago and I was like, damn man, why didn't you come out? <laughs> you see all your mistakes when you're older. Oh yeah. But uh, but anyway, he was definitely him and Mario Lemieux for sure. You know they they just had so many moves and you know shoot the puck from anywhere. Mm-hmm. I remember Mario banking one off my. Uh, pad from behind the goal line and he banked in and off my pad and in the net <laughs> and he tried to do it oh yeah oh and you're like fuck you you're too good get out of here you're way too good <laughs> you shouldn't be doing that you yeah. know but, but those, those guys were amazing and then when i was in chicago playing against brett all those years when he was oh, yeah. in st louis uh I, i'll tell you i was sure glad that when brett and i were on the same team I know he was just unbelievable. And anybody who grew up here in St. Louis playing hockey or didn't play hockey, didn't really matter. You were, you were influenced by Brett Hall for sure. Listen, you played with so many great players though. You came in, you know, you had the Ronix, um, you know, the Larmers, the, the Chelioses, you got Letton and Hall, Madonna. I mean, Sergei Zubov, who may be the most underrated player in the history of the game. Then you got Matt Sundin and Alexander Mogilny, man, you play with some incredible players throughout the course of your career. Can you put anybody at the top of the list, Eddie? Can you do that? Like, who's oh, the, yeah, who's the sure. most who's the best player you play with? Chelios. Oh, tell me why. Yeah, because yeah, I found it interesting. I watched your Hall of Fame speech. Most guys go on and on. They thank like fifteen thousand people. I think he was the only teammate that you that you thanked in your Hall of Fame speech. I found that interesting. Yeah. Well, Chelly came at a time in my career when I was uh, young and uh, rookie and impressionable and he just came in and he was a workhorse which i totally respect you know he was the first one on the ice the last one off uh, you know just always in the gym uh you know pumping the iron and, and you know doing everything he could to be the best he could be uh you know he, he ended up being our captain and and such a great leader said the right things at the right times and and just uh treated every player on the team the same uh he's the ultimate captain he you know does it on and off the ice uh you know if you're out with the fellas for a green light night and uh next day's practice he again he's the first one on the practice and and probably didn't get much sleep so i had a lot of respect for him and and 
you all know, like he played sometimes 50 minutes a game, mm-hmm. which I know is about incredible. that, Eddie. I know about that, Eddie. Don't worry. I know about that. <laughs> yeah. So he's just an incredible guy, a great friend, um, and just a great leader. And, you know, I wish we had played, got a chance to play together uh, towards the end of our careers and uh, it would have been awesome to win a cup with him. Why do you think, though, Dallas was the team that got you over the top, though? I mean, you look at that core group versus the core group in Chicago. I know you made it to the final, but what what was it about Dallas that allowed you guys to to just do it, you know, you know, finish it off and, and, and win the Stanley Cup? Well, I think we had a great team in Chicago when we went to the finals in 92, but I think I was just inexperienced. Like, I was a really good goalie, but not a, a great, great goalie yet. I was learning, and I was just still a little young, and I, I made a few mistakes. Uh, you know, of course, you win and lose as a team, but you know, when you, when you got a hot goalie and, and he's hot at the right time, it makes a huge difference. And I I played good in the finals, but I didn't play great like I needed to when I was with Chicago against uh, Pittsburgh. But in Dallas, you know, I was more mature. Uh, you know, I could handle the the pressure and uh, the press a little bit better. Uh, Bob Gainey did a fabulous job of putting together a veteran team. Um, you know, we were an older team, but uh, very smart, very wise. Uh, you know, we stuck to our plan, uh, stuck to our system. We stuck together. Uh, we were a close team, but we had a lot of talent on that team too. So there's a lot of things that contribute to uh, winning the Stanley Cup and being that successful and and I, it has to all go right for you. Like you got to have some luck along the way too, and we did. So there's a lot of things that go into it. But um, you know, Bob Gainey, he was the mastermind behind uh, the team in Dallas, and you know, the, the great uh, veteran players like Guy Carbonell that he brought in, Mike Keane, and uh, you know, we had some big uh, defensive style defensemen which block shots. You know, like Craig, Craig Ludwig and Patch and um, Maddie. Uh, Maddie. So, you know, those those guys, um, you know, they just – we just knew that we had a good thing going and no one wanted to, to let anyone down in that organization. How was Hitch in a locker room? And, you know, in, in everybody in St. Louis, and, and we're obviously St. Louis based here, and, of course, we've seen Hitch for years here and very, very successful. We love him as far as his personality and how real he is. How was he in a locker room? With this, uh, holding up with the big boys in that locker room, though, Eddie, like you got Holly, you got Modo, you got Hatch, you got Madvichuk, you got, you know, guys that just played in the league a long time. Like how did he come in and get everybody on the same page? Yeah, well, I think, again, when you have Bob Ganey, you know, as the general manager back in you, um, you know, Hitch had a lot of clout and, um, you know, he, he was a detailed guy. He, you know, stayed on top of things and he would come in and talk to the guys and the guys wanted to win and, you know, we'd do whatever it takes. And, and you know what Hitch would, uh, he would ask us our opinions on things. He was very fair with, uh, you know, our ice, uh, as far as, uh, uh, practicing goes, he would let guys like Carbonell, myself, and some of the other veterans. Um, you know, if we didn't need to practice, he he would let us have those days off so that we were ready for games. Uh, I think he handled us perfectly, and um, I think he he is definitely a uh, veteran player's coach. Uh, you know, he he knew when to back off and he knew when to you know step on us a little bit. And um, I think every great coach knows how to do that. Yeah, it's probably well put in terms of him being a veteran coach. Did you like Keenan? Yeah, I loved Keenan. Uh, he gave me my, my chance, my opportunity to play in the NHL. I'm always going to be grateful and thankful for that. Uh, he pushed us uh, probably harder than any other coach I've had and played a lot of mind games, which when I was younger, I took it tough and maybe took it wrong. Uh the wrong way a few times, but looking back, I know what he was trying to do. He was trying to make me uh, a stronger uh, goaltender, both on and off the ice mentally. You know, he wanted me to be there. And, um, you know, some of the things he did to me, I was pissed off. And, you know, he knew that he could do that with me and and I'd still play great or or play even better. So um, that and all the off-ice stuff, 
uh, all our training in the gym. Like he brought in the, the best uh, trainers. And um, one of the other things he, he did when I was a rookie, um, he brought in Cal Botterill. And, um, you know, Cal Botterill, uh, sports psychologist, he, I think he helped out our team. I think he helped out a lot of individual players that went on uh, to have great careers like myself. I used a lot of his uh, teachings throughout my career, and I still use it. So thankful for uh, Mike Keenan bringing in Cal Botterill. But do you understand, though, <clears throat> being a goalie is a little different when you have a hardcore coach, a hardcore coach like that, too, though. Like, you're kind of in your own little realm of things where if you just go out there and do your thing or kind of like – you just if you're if you're playing okay, like no one no one bothers you. But do you understand where people would look at Keenan and be like, I can't take this? Did you see any of that as far as the Fords and a D are concerned? Oh yeah, for sure. I saw lots of guys that cratered and um just uh don't want to say any names, but they just couldn't handle that mental beating that uh, that could happen once in a while and and uh you know, back then the rosters were a lot bigger so guys were competing in the warm-ups for a, a yeah. position to play during the game and i mean the warm-ups were just crazy sometimes and they'd be like what the heck slow down people are just you know skating around 100 miles an hour and guys are running into one another and um you know just heaters are flying by my ears and in, in, in the warm-ups and but uh yeah no i could see there were a lot of guys who didn't handle that stuff very well and and Keenan would pick on them, and then their careers would be pretty much over. They, they, they'd either get traded or sent to the minors, and you know they just they couldn't couldn't deal with that stuff. So, listen, one of the most vivid memories in my childhood, Eddie, was Game Four, 1993 playoffs. I'm at the game, and the Blues win in overtime. They ended up sweeping the Blackhawks. And you lost your shit, Eddie, oh, when they scored. I think God. Craig Janney scored from the wall. Somebody bumped Fucked you. Up goal. Somebody bumped yeah. you. It might have been Holy. I'm trying to think who bumped you below the goal line. And you went crazy. You broke your stick over the crossbar. I had more people tell me when they knew I was going to have Jan to make sure I asked you this question. What was going through your mind? What were you saying to the referee? And take us through that play, Eddie. Yeah, so I remember it pretty vividly. I went behind the net played the puck as I was going back into the net. You are correct. Holly uh, <laughs> <laughs> runs into me accidentally. Yeah. Is what he says. And, uh, you know, they scored on the open net. And, uh, the bad thing about it is the ref was like 10 feet away when Holly ran into me and, and, you know, kept me from getting back in the net. And so it happened right in front of the ref. And I'm, I'm not asking him like, Hey, like you're not going to call a penalty on this and he's like no like that was perfectly fine like i was like are you kidding me he just like knocked me over so i couldn't get back in the net and they scored an open net goal on me and to win the series you're going to let it happen that way and he wouldn't have any he wouldn't talk to me or anything so that's when i lost it yeah so <laughs> what you what kind of damage did you do to the dressing room too did that carry over off the ice or no oh yeah i think there was an ambulance down there and oh the ambulance got smashed and <laughs> no no it wasn't the ambulance it was the uh it was the uh the equipment van oh yeah, yeah fuck hilarious. that fucking van anyway who cares <laughs> <laughs> hey eddie the first time i met you you came in a locker room and i, and I go hey i'm cam you know i'm, I'm from eureka missouri I'm like, yeah, yeah i go i want to apologize to you i think uh, right after that 93 series my dad I think he accidentally spilled a beer on you whenever you're walking back out. So again, I'm going to apologize for that. My mom got <laughs> pissing him for that night too. So he he actually wanted to you wanted to reimburse it where he wanted to send you a receipt for the beer that he dropped on you so you'd pay him <laughs> back. That's how gutless he is. <laughs> Eddie, well, you came and worked for the Blues for like a week. I think I'll, I'll never forget getting the news. I was I was oh yeah, it was great. I was on my honeymoon in 2009. They're like the Blues. Hey, somebody from the Blues called me. Management, not going to say who. He calls me and said, Hey, what do you think if we hire Eddie Bell for? I'm like. Ed Belfort? Wow, that, that'll be interesting to see him work for the St. Louis Blues all of all up. teams. Are you kidding me? Yeah. And but you didn't stick around too long, Eddie. What happened there? They kicked me out. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> How long did you last? Like two weeks? <laughs> no, I was there for six months. It, yeah. uh, <laughs> it was just a, a, a miscommunication. Um, it was supposed to be a, a part-time job where I'd just come in and help out once in a while and and you know, help out with the young goalies and do a little bit of scouting. And it was right in uh, the transition from um, 
uh, Larry Plo to uh, Arm, Army. Yeah. So um, I was kind of being uh, directed in a few different ways, and it, it turned out to be a, a full-time job with part-time pay. So um, it just was you know, starting to become a bit of a distraction for, for me and my family with how much I was starting to travel. And I don't know if uh, maybe that was because I was doing a, a good job, but uh, it really wasn't uh, playing out the way I thought it was going to. And um, the main reason was I needed to get back to my family. Yeah. I, I, listen, I'm not going to lie. It was crazy seeing Ed Belfort walking it. around with a blues tracksuit. I loved it. Hanging out with, oh with Burt Godin in the equipment room. Oh. I'm like, is that Ed Belfort? What the hell is going on No, I followed him around the locker room. But I shouldn't like have creep. been so There was a lot of Dallas people who found their yeah. way here to St. Louis once Army took over. And, and yeah. obviously a lot of positives, too. I mean, Sergei Zubov even worked for the organization. How good was that guy? Oh, amazing. You, you, you're right when you said it earlier. The, one of the most underrated players in the history of the game and uh just a, a awesome teammate and uh you know what uh, one of the things that uh, i still can't believe like he would smoke two or three cigarettes between every period and he'd still go out there and just you know dangle everybody and not get tired and just an amazing player but uh great teammate obviously uh the quarterback of our power play and and uh, you know Probably, I, I don't know how many guys stole a puck from him in his career, but maybe one or two, I would think, because he would just, you know, deke everybody out at, at our own blue line and, and make an awesome pass up the middle to Lettner or, or Mo, and they go in for a breakaway or, you know, set up an awesome play. Um, so, you know, again, very underrated, like you said. Very much so. And I want to ask you this, and, and, and one of the biggest things that – you know, don't, don't get me wrong. When we played against you, like uh, as a Blues fan, uh, you, you were, people hated you here, and that's good. That means you're doing your job. But the one thing that I think Blues fans appreciate with with you, one way or the other, was your helmet. You had the baddest ass <laughs> fucking helmet ever, Addy the Eagle. Like it just all worked. Like how'd that all come about? Uh, so when I was uh, would have been my third year pro, uh, I guess they realized I was gonna possibly stick around for a little bit and they let me go get a, a Greg Harrison mask which you know that's a big deal back then yeah. um, you know I had the helmet with the screen on uh, you know and, and of course you get hit in the head with those helmets and you get cut open you get concussed and you know the Greg Harrison mask at the time was the best mask and um, thank goodness uh, they allowed me to get one of those because uh, I remember playing in Toronto that the little rink there uh and, you know, it was like the puck was just flying everywhere all the time. It was such a fast game in that little building, as it was similar in, in uh, Chicago. But it just seemed like in Toronto, it was, everything happened so much faster. And Peter Zezel let one rip uh, top of the circles and got me right on top of the – right above the, the screen part above your eyes, but right on the uh, forehead. And I still – think that was the hardest I've ever been hit in the head. I saw, uh, you know, some stars. I could oh, yeah. smell the, the the burning rubber from the puck hitting my Ooh, mask. Wow. Good God. Yeah, and, and thank goodness I had that mask. But uh, Greg Harrison was the one who made it for me. And um, I asked him to put a mean-looking bird on it. Yeah. And, and he put he chose the eagle. And then uh, Keenan just started calling me Eddie the Eagle from then on. Wow. And stuff. No wonder you like him. That's a badass-ass <laughs> nickname ever. <laughs> hey. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. So listen, uh, and I want to get into the to the uh, Belfort Spirits and talk about your whiskey and all that. But you know, just watching you play, and I became listen. I was I was a diehard Brett Hall fan, and now knowing him personally and Darcy, man, it's just unbelievable. It's amazing how your life just goes full circle. But you, you know, watching you play, I always felt like you were always pissed off. Like this guy must be just always in a bad mood. Must be always be mean and just angry. Like. Were you always in the zone? Like when you're playing, were you one of those guys you wanted everyone to leave you alone on game day? Or were you way looser behind the mask and, and in the dressing room than, than you appeared when we're watching you play? No, I was pretty much like that all the time. Uh, just very focused, determined. And I think for me, uh, when I played uh, with other guys like that, it, it just made me that much better. Um, I didn't like it when guys were goofing around too much in the locker room. And, um, I always felt like 
you know, a bit of a distraction. But as I grew um, and matured in, in the league, you know, there's there's a, a time when you need somebody to, to, to break the ice and crack a joke and, you know, loosen the guys up a bit. And, you know, every guy on the team is – as, as important as the next to, to become a championship team and, and win the Stanley Cup. And, um, you know, that's, that's the very thing that you learn as you go through your career. It's like you can't do it by yourself. You know, two or three guys can't do it by themselves. It takes a team to win. And so for me, that was me. I was very focused, very hardworking, determined, uh, competitive, even just in practice. And uh, I think that you know, helps the guys that are, are similar in personality to me. It helps them be better and it helps everybody, you know, work just a little bit harder. And then you need those guys that are goofing around just to calm us down a little bit because you can't go, you know, a hundred percent every day. So, uh, Mike Keen was one of the guys, I mean, I, he was one of those guys that would, he knew how to do both. He was yeah. so balanced. He, he would keep the locker room, you know, he say the joke at the right time and keep us loose at the right time. But, you know, he's the first guy to, to, to get into a fight, you know, when needed. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, blocking shots, you know, playing great defense and scoring great goals, timely goals. You know, he's one of those guys. Um, so, you know, it, it, it definitely, uh, for me, um, when we had a green light night, that was my night to have fun and, and you know, let down and, and be a little bit crazy. You know, Mike Keene, great guy, by the way. I go, I go to his uh, his fantasy camps up in, uh, in in Winnipeg. And by the way, Eddie, well, you mentioned that being a great locker room, but I think I played three extra years in the NHL because I was good in the locker room because I certainly wasn't good on the wall. I was getting my ass kicked left and right, so I think I was really good making light of situations in the locker room, so I completely understand that. But I do want to get into the whiskey. Okay, I, I listened to a couple of interviews from you, and um, you said that you did a little homework on your – on your grandparents or ancestors, and they were moonshiners. I'm like, damn, is he from Eureka? Because I know a couple moonshiners out in Eureka as well. So we, I was wondering where you started that, how you got into that whole thing, and I guess how crazy that was to go back in time and see that uh, some of your uh, relatives were moonshiners out in the woods like that, man. Well, we are Irish, right? Yeah. So. Okay, there you go then. <laughs> there you go then. But, uh, yeah, my son, Dane, and I, about six years ago, uh, he was done his career, and we started – looking at something we could do together. And, um, you know, I've always uh, told my kids, you know, time is our most valuable commodity, so don't waste it. And if you're going to do something, do something that you love and, and, and hopefully do something that you put all that time into, it can be profitable. So uh, we started looking at uh, different businesses and, um, you know, we thought that uh, in the beginning we we're going to make vodka. We researched the vodka market and it was uh, very saturated uh, with a lot of different brands out there. So we started looking into the rums and whiskeys and, uh, whiskey was just starting to kind of take off. And, uh, so we thought, you know what, let's, uh, order a still. Uh, so we ordered a still and we were going to start making it in, a, in our garage on, a, on our ranch and, you know, learn, learning how to make it. And we quickly learned that that was highly illegal. I could have told you that Eddie. I could have told you that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> right. So, uh, we thought, well, you know what? Well, let's let's do this the right way. So we went to school, learned how to make uh, the juice properly, uh, learned about all the laws and regulations, and you know all the little fine details that you need to have uh, to run this type of a business. Uh, then we went through the proper channels, and uh, we got our license, and then we started making it. And um, you know now we have somewhere in the neighborhood of like twenty three hundred barrels of uh, mm. bourbon and rye uh, whiskeys aging. Uh, we've been on the shelves uh, since last fall, uh, I think uh, beginning of November, late October. Wow. Um, yeah, so uh, people are loving. Um, I mean, I like to think they're not lying to us. They, they love our, our Texas pecan bourbon. Uh, they love our, our regular rye whiskey. And we have a, a straight rye whiskey, limited edition, with a very unique uh, chalice on top of it. Probably looks pretty familiar to you guys. No, it does. Oh. And listen, hey. Eddie, don't think I didn't see that. And oh, don't think I it. wasn't going to ask you to say, hey, listen, I'm sending you my address. I want. Hook us up, Eddie. I, I, I need one I can drink with, and I need one that's signed. signed okay? So is. I need two of those oh, with a chalice yeah. on top. If we can make that well, happen. High maintenance over here. 
<laughs> and I'll I'll send you a holy tequila in return. How yeah, about that? A little Codigo. There you go. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, we love it, man. Yeah, it's pretty cool. I know it's a, it is interesting like that. And, and and do you feel like you guys is it hard work doing the whole thing? You got you got everybody in play. Are you your son, you're making your son do a lot of the work. Are you kind of sitting back and just watching it all kind of uh, fold into fruition here. Or how, how does it all go down on a daily basis? Yeah, so um, we all have our roles. Uh, Dane and I started this, like I said, six years ago, and, and now we have 10 employees. Uh, Dane is part of the sales staff, and he does all our tastings and all our private parties. Uh, Dane's very good at all the social aspect of, of our business. Uh, people, you know, they want to know the details of our whiskey and, you know, how it came about. And, um, you know, Dane, you know, he went to school to learn how to make the juice. Our first 12 barrels he made himself. Uh, those, uh, the whiskey in those barrels uh, is the whiskey in our limited edition straight rye whiskey with the chalice on top. So we're yeah. very proud about those first 12 barrels. And, and the whiskey turned out fabulous. So, um, you know, you just never know in the beginning if it's going to turn out good or not. And, you know, you think it's good and you let other people try it and, and, and they think it's good. And I got to tell you a little funny story. So we were doing a, a charity event in Aspen, Colorado, which is 30 minutes from Basalt, where uh, uh, Dane did an internship at uh, Woody Creek Distillery. Uh, thankful to those guys, uh, Mark Kleckner and, and, and those guys there. Uh, you know, they did a, a, a really nice favor for, for Belfort Spirits by letting Dane work at the distillery uh, during the day. And then at night, he would coach their hockey team. Uh, so he, he was in his glory. He was coaching hockey and making whiskey at the same time. And um, so... Uh, the Dallas Stars and Chicago Blackhawks are doing a charity event in Aspen uh, to raise money for for uh, local uh, minor hockey. And so I mentioned to the boys, I said, hey, listen, you know, we haven't tasted our whiskey yet, and it's about six months old right now. Would you guys like to, to come to the distillery with us and try it? And um, you guys know Bobby Basson. Oh, you know, yeah. He's He's a great guy, one of my oh, yeah. favorite teammates. Maybe, uh, maybe you know, the nicest guy of all time. Tougher than shit, right? Too. <laughs> right, yeah. tougher than shit. Pound for pound, probably one of the toughest guys in the league, and and he doesn't drink. And uh, so he comes with us, and and I think six, seven other guys came with us to the distillery, and we pour some whiskey for everybody. And Bobby says, "You know what? I'm going to try a little bit of it." Oh. And and Bobby Basson tries a little sip of it, and he's like, "Oh wow, this is really smooth. I wasn't expecting anything like this." He goes, Ed, I don't drink, but if I was going to drink, I would drink your whiskey for sure. <laughs> That's that when you know. Was, he's, he's, probably, big, he's probably pounding it. That's home. when you know it's good right there, baby. That's when, you, when <laughs> people don't even know what whiskey is. They take a little sip. And uh, and they and they pump you up like that. So he's a great guy, oh, tougher yeah. and dog shit. He was just in town not too long ago during yeah, the All Star break. So scored a goal. Yeah. Hey, last hockey question for you. are you are you ever going to get back into hockey, Eddie? And but I got to ask you though, when you guys won the cup in Dallas, could you imagine if you were Hoshik, like you would have you would have gone absolutely berserk if Holy would have scored that goal on you with a foot in the crease. By the way, so I don't know if his foot was in the crease or if it wasn't. Well, you saw the highlights. I celebrated. I, mean, I was so happy that Holy won a Stanley Cup, and obviously you were unbelievable throughout the course of the playoffs. But how did you see that play, and what was your reaction at the other end of the ice? Well. My reaction was I just, you know, was in disbelief for the first, I don't know, maybe 10, it felt like an hour, but probably like 10, 20 seconds until uh, Matty, you know, jumped off the bench and he's racing towards me full speed. So, uh, you know, we met, I think, somewhere around the blue line and uh, in midair and ended up rolling around on the ice for a couple of seconds like a, a happily wed couple. But uh, it's cute. Look at Looking at the goal on on replay, um, you know the rule states, you know if if you had control of the puck, mm -hmm. and if you were pushed into the crease by the defenseman, as long as you had control of the puck, uh, which Holly did, he kicked it from his left skate up uh, up mm -hmm. to his stick, and then scores. And uh, I can't remember who it was. Maybe it was Zitnik or somebody there that that kind of ran into him. So I feel like it was probably one of those judgment calls, but you know, with the third overtime, you know, everyone's getting tired, and and the ref saw it the way he saw it, and you know, puck ends up in the net, and and the defenseman, you know, kind of pushed Holly around, I think pushed him around, and he spun around, right? Yeah. 
it, and then kicked it up to his his uh, stick and then scored. I mean, what the hell's wrong with that? Right. Nothing. It's okay. a fucking goal, Andy. There Why you even go. ask that question, Andy? Hey. That's a fucking good goal, baby. Dude, right. Have better right. defense. Exactly. Yeah. There you go. Don't listen to. <laughs> hey, don't support Cam, Eddie. Uh, we, Eddie, we love you, Come buddy. Come on, man. Ed, are you going to get back into hockey? Or are you have no interest in that? Oh, well, right now I don't have any time. But I mean, I love. Uh, you know, once in a while, somebody will call me up and ask me for my advice on on a certain situation or a player. You know, I love helping out in any way I can. And, um, you know, one of the things that Dane and I would like to do at some point in the future is uh, maybe own a USHL team and, uh, and help out some young players, uh, right. you know, help them, you know, fulfill their dreams. That would be, uh, you know, something very, uh, I guess, happy for me and, and Dane. Like, we would really love to help younger players achieve those dreams and, and get college scholarships and, and possibly make it to the NHL. Wow, that's awesome, awesome dude. Well, All right, hey, listen, I'm going to be sending you my address. Don't think uh, I'm no, kidding. seriously. And, on and, that. And, and how can people who are listening get get their hands on that? Yes. Because we got we've got listeners all over the world here, Eddie. Yeah. So uh, right now we're in uh, Illinois, we're in Texas, uh, we're in North Dakota, South Dakota, uh, soon to be in Missouri. I think here in the next. You know, I mean, we would be there already if if. Uh, uh, the coronavirus wasn't on. Uh, mm-hmm. Unfortunately, it is. So uh, as soon as this stuff, uh, you know, subsides, uh, we'll be in Missouri. We'll be in Minnesota, Wisconsin, uh, soon to be in Tennessee. Uh, and we're working on uh, getting to Canada this year, hopefully sometime this fall. Wow. Love it, man. Awesome. Well, hey, we'll thanks be looking for doing forward this, to- Eddie. We appreciate it, man, very much. And all the best to you and, and all the best. With the uh, with the whiskey, looking yeah, forward to that. We're gonna be uh, that. we yeah, we're gonna be trying that bad boy out soon. And anytime we have anything, we have a lot of things coming up here. We got new rinks in here in St. Louis, Eddie. We we want you to come out. I don't give a damn if you play goalie or not. We just want to hang out in the locker room with you, man. So <laughs> appreciate you coming on, dude. Uh, you know, it's you're a very interesting guy, and uh, you're somebody Andy and I both watched as a kid. And it's good to talk to you, man. So thanks for coming on, big boy. Appreciate yeah, it. thanks. Thanks for having me, guys. Really appreciate it. And I, I look forward to coming to St. Louis and have a shinny with you guys. You right got on. It, oh, I'm going to get ready for that. I'm stick handling <laughs> my basement for that one, Eddie. Thanks for talking <laughs> with us. See we'll you. see you later, big boy. See you. Yeah. Bye bye. Thanks, thanks, man. All right, that was episode 37. That was Eddie Belfour. That dude's cool, man. Very some, quiet. Very quiet. Whiskey. Oh, he's very, very. How about when I asked him? Stoic. Uh, like you always came across like you were angry. Mad at the world, he's like, yeah, he's pretty much was. <laughs> Boy, he's competitive, very competitive. I mean, look at MJ, like look at Michael Jordan now. He's just like, he's just like, he's got, you know, he's just like, doo, 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 like. But then he's fucking like, it just, you're not, you're not the same way you were, and sometimes you're not the same way you were when you're off the ice. Like mm-hmm. I, I was always whatever, but for guys like that, man, they're intense, and then they're off, and they're like, oh, I'm gonna do an interview. Okay, this is how I really am, but on the ice, I'm a fucking psycho. How okay. tough, great you, psycho you are! You, yeah, you are a psycho. How tough do you think it would have been to be his backup? Oh God! <laughs> like he's like, dude, how about you're trying anybody? to take my job? I'm gonna fucking own you. <laughs> I'm gonna uh, any glove save. I'm gonna just take and like windmill the bad boy. You know, he was so good. He man. was so good, man. So good. And he came and worked for the Blues. It was really weird. I know. I was on a team. It was great. It was weird. Like, what's up, Eddie? Like, shit. You had that long. You didn't remember that either. You thought you saw him. No, no. You're like, I ran into him in Peoria. I'm like, when were you in Peoria? I've never been in Peoria. I didn't fucking say that. (laughs) God, you you did tell me that. In a private conversation. In Peoria? I yeah. haven't been to it. The I'm, only t- I'm releasing a private conversation. I went to Peoria one time to watch Avenged Sevenfold. That's it. That's it. But I said, what happened to you? How long do you last? He said six weeks. <laughs> yeah, one long. <laughs> one long. A lot of these guys who play a long time, they make a lot of money. They're not into doing work that doesn't pay a lot of money. Yeah, I know. I've I told you about them. that, man. I mean, that's one thing I'll give Cam a shout out about as a former um, player. Oh, air quotes. Jesus Christ. Um, <laughs> What the fuck is that? You're very, like, you're committed, man. Yeah. And you have work ethic. You got to have that work ethic. You got to know when to show up. You got to be there. And so you don't mess around with that. Yeah, no, no. I know how to. And a lot of guys up. could, they don't know how to no. transition. No, we, and we know who those guys are, yes. too. Like, you have something like. Yeah, yeah. That's pl- what do you have to like, like remind you every day? Uh, yeah, no, I, I don't mind. What do you forget? Go ahead and remind me, but I'm going to be there. And I'm going to be there 30 minutes early, and it is what it is. Some people are like, oh, that's today. What happened? That's well, today. I, I'm I golfing. I didn't know. I'm golfing. <laughs> golfing. Give a fuck with your buddy? We got shit to do. Do you golf? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you good at golf? No, no, no. I'm an entertainer, baby. All right, we're going to have to go golfing. Maybe we should bring some uh, video crew out there. Yeah, I think we can do that. I think and we, we can bring it out to a, to a golf course. 
All right, man. That was episode 37. Ed Belfour, Hall of Famer, man. Yep. That is a... Uh, I look for... Some interviews, man, I look forward to talking to that person. Ed yep. Belfour. He fell awesome. in that category. Yeah, he did. Great dude. Lots more to come. Check out our Instagram. Check out our Twitter. At Cam and Strict Pod on Instagram and Twitter. You can check out Cam's personal page, my personal page, Instagram, Twitter. Hit us up. You have suggestions. You have feedback. Everyone's volunteering feedback now. Yeah, yeah. No one hesitates to tell us anything. No, I know. Any opinion oh, they gosh. have, we hear about it. Cam's cussing. I'm all working angles. on it. I'm working on stuff. Well, somebody I chirped you about that. We I, talked about it in the previous I episode. I don't say the B word anymore. Mm-hmm. The B-R-O-A-D word? Yeah. Is that how you spell it? B-R-O-A-D? Yeah. I'm not doing that anymore. I'm not going to... I'm going to say... I, I'm changing my ways. And mm-hmm. I adapt, baby. Mm-hmm. Like on podcasts, I can do my, my stuff. So I didn't even say shit there. I said stuff. Mm-hmm. See, I'm already learning. Some players may think, I don't know if I can go on that podcast, man. They're I, gonna Cam get me. scares me. Yeah. <laughs> get I, out of here. You love it when the guy who's got like a six or seven year deal, they already have like oh, 60 no, mil in the bank. 70 and a And they're like, I don't I'm know afraid I'm going to say something I don't want to say. I don't know if they're going to. My team might be. What the fuck did you just say? <laughs> They owe you 70 million fucking bucks and you play 35 minutes a game and you're worried about what? What? I love telling Cam that when I'm, when I'm talking to somebody. What? And we've got some good guests coming on, man. Some big time players, what? current players. But some of them are a little reluctant to like go what out on I their own to do you? an interview that's not controlled by a team. What am I going to ask Because they you? don't know what to do. Like if it's not set up by the team, like are we allowed to are do we, it? Oh, wait, what, what do I my say? Team? They just signed you for 70 million bucks. You could do whatever you want. They might, You're get, ma- about- they might get mad at me if I do this. I, are you the athletic? <laughs> no, no. Wait, what? <laughs> Fuck. The athletic. Oh, God. I'm like, dude, you're $70 fine. 70 million you're fine. dollars. Like, you I, got like six years left line, on your deal. I was deal. a fifth line guy and I, would, I didn't give a shit. <laughs> uh, anyway, it's okay. Okay. It's all good. All right. Lots more everybody. coming. Hope you enjoyed Ed Belfort. See you guys. Episode 37. Right on. Peace.